Okay, it's 6.30, and I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Cunningham Town Board. It's Monday, July 12th, 2021. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wu. Councilmember Evans. Here. Councilmember Hersey. Here. Councilmember Colasetti. Here. Councilmember Bishop. Here. Councilmember Wilkin. Here. Councilmember Quisenberry. Here. Mayor Marlin. Present. Uh, Supervisor Chenoweth. Present. Okay. Um, are there any additions to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to public participation. I have one public input card. Since this is our first town board meeting back in person, I want to remind folks if you want to addri address the Cunningham Town Board, you pick up a uh, public input card that are on the back table there, fill it out, and give it to our interim city clerk, and she'll get it to me. So I have one card from Angie W., and this is regarding 206 and 208 California leases. So Angie, please come up to sit at one of the microphones and you can speak. And you'll have up to five minutes. Hi, good evening everybody. Um, so I just wanted to address the lease for 206 and 208 East California that was passed um, at the last board meeting. So just for my clarification, on May 7th, we had gotten the first letter that the Cunningham Township became the new owner of our properties at 206 and 208 East California. At that time, we were given until August 15th of this year, of course, to get the incentive of the $2,000 we also received an updated letter on June 7th stating the very same thing. And then June 30th, we received an email stating that um, Cunningham Township would not be renewing our current lease. And again, that was June 30th. And it states that we would have to sign this new month-to-month -month lease that was offered and approved by the board um, by July 15th. So my question is, my current lease does not end until July 31st. So I'm just questioning the timing of the dates because if I were to sign this, it would be backdated starting July 1st. So why would I sign a Cunningham Township lease when I already have a current lease that goes until July 31st? And then it also states if I did not sign it by July 15th, I would not get the incentive of the $2,000, whereas before, we had until um, August 15th to move out to receive that incentive. And those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to address the Cunningham Town Board? Looks like we have one other person. Go ahead, Martel Miller. How you doing, Mayor? I'm Martel Miller. 
I'm from Champaign. That's where I live at right now, but I stayed in Atlanta for, I'd say, close to 16 years. Um, I'm here to address the council about township, and I would like for the, the township board to come to our our place of business and see what we do there because I'm, I'm hearing a lot of things about what people think about the township. But I've been doing on city government probably over close to 15 years. I've been in this chambers numerous of times and I, I talk about people. You see on my shirt, love my people. And when I say that, it's, it's we're talking about poor people where you don't see their voices coming here but I see them every day. Um, right now, um, I'm hearing that Abana City is um, putting on roadway that they should be uh, like a um, extended stay. You can't stay there no more than 28 days, but we don't have a shelter, because uh, see you at home has closed. Abana don't have a shelter, but we got homeless in Abana. I see them all the time. We had uh, some people standing in a tent in a banner right off Main Street. I went over there probably two or three times a week to see about them, make sure they're okay. But for us, not to have a shelter, then put where a hotel can be fine for having somebody there more than 30 days, I think the mayor could make like a executive order through this time, which we're gonna need it because of they going to start evicting people? Are we just going to let them s stay on the street or figure out how, how to help the poor people? You know, um, I'm just sad to see what I see going on when it comes to people. But when it comes to corporations and land developers, they are very well taken care of. But poor people ain't taken care of. And a lot of times people say they don't pay taxes. They pay taxes all the time. When they, when they buy food at the restaurants, when they buy food from the, from the grocery stores, when they buy these cigarettes or alcohol, you know, t taxes are being paid by poor people. So I feel they should be taken care of. And our office is you can't get the grant from us. That, that is the last resort for you to get any kind of income. If you, gon if you don't be able to require the grant from us, that means you got nothing. And I watch people's lives change every day, you know, from being homeless to give them dignity. You know, once you stay out on the street so long, you lose confidence in yourself. I just want y'all to pay attention to what goes on in township office. Years ago, I was coming here, they had a lady that was over the township office, and they was clapping their hand because she was saving money. When do you know when poor people don't need money, don't need assistance. They, they were clapping their hand in here because she was saving them money. Danielle's predecessor deal with 26 people with four full-time staff. We, we deal with probably, at one time during the, during the pandemic, I had 70 clients. You know, I tried to reach them. You know, homeless folks don't keep phones, but I did my best to make sure that I could try to stay in contact where we can get them a resource to get them the help that they need. Um, I hear that we got three houses in a banner that's empty. You know, that that is not fair to people that's homeless. If the city got houses and they're not renting them, they should find a way to use them houses. They should never stay here empty when we have people sleeping on the streets. You know, and I know y'all see them. Y'all drive by them just like I do, but I don't drive by, I stop and see about them. You know, we got uh, mentally ill people walking the streets here. I get calls from y'all officers just to come out and talk to them. You know, we got to do something about what goes on in the battle, about the homeless. Champagne got a shelter that's not closed, and I don't consider Champagne a banner two different towns when it comes to poor people, because poor people go where they can, and it, uh, don't nothing split Champagne a banner for Wright Street. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
I think we can clear up some of the misunderstanding about the hotel situation too when that item comes up on the agenda. Um, does anyone else wish to address the township at this point? Okay, we'll move on to committee to verify bills. Danielle. Good evening. It's, uh, it's nice to be in person and see your faces, not in a box. Um, so this last month, we had $31,227.38 in expenditures from the town fund, and we had $58,802.85 in the uh, expenditures from the general assistance fund. So that's a total of $90,000. Uh, $30.23. I'll just note on the income side, you'll see that we were paid out uh, two second property tax disbursements, um, totaling over a half a million dollars this last month. So I was really pleased to get that um, before the end of uh, before the end of the year. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and then I'll go over the rest of the memo in front of you during the reports of officers. Any questions about the bills? Is there a motion to approve the town fund and general assistance fund? I move to approve the town fund uh, bills, general assistance fund. Second. Moved by Chandra, seconded by James. Further discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Evans? Yes. Councilmember Hersey? Yes. Councilmember Colasetti? Yes. Councilmember Bishop? Yes. Councilmember Wilkin? Yes. Councilmember Quisenberry? Yes. That motion passes. Uh, reports of officers. Um, so I brought a printed copy of the uh, supervisor's report. I just want to go over a few things. I think the, the big picture report is that on general assistance, uh, things are getting better, and with housing, things are getting worse. So essentially, with general assistance, we support uh, people who are out of work. We're seeing more people going back to work, and that's a good situation. Uh, and we also support people who are awaiting disability of payments um, or disabled in Urbana. And we're seeing a number, a high number of um, Social Security um, uh, cases. In fact, most of our closures, many of our closures each, each month are due to that, which really is kind of unprecedented. Um, we, we're, uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of advocacy around that and it's paying off. Um, so we are at 86 current participants. I think last month we were at 93. Um, 33 are homeless. Um, we are opening the community work program. We have two tracks. Martel Miller is our case manager for the for what is now called the Employment and Education Opportunities Track. And then Liz Parishan is um, our case manager for um, the Disability and Wellness Track. And then Lilia Garcia is uh, head over um, the track that supports families as well as those who are seeking, who are applying for the first time for Social Security. So essentially, uh, with rental assistance, um, we supported 12 households with rental assistance this last month. It's been pretty steady. It, you know, typically we've seen eight to 10 a month. That has gone up the last two months. Um, uh, the mayor mentioned at our last meeting that uh, there is utility assistance available at the county level. That's through the emergency rental assistance program that just opened up this last week, and it can pay up to $20,000 in back rent and utilities. Um, so you have to be behind in both rent and utilities, not just utilities for that, but it can pay for that, and that's water, power. Um, only complete applications will be, um, and they must be submitted by mail or dropped off. There's no email. So anyone who's living in Urbana who needs help applying for rental assistance, our office has turned from processing rental assistance cases. We've actually processed everything on deck that we have. And we are now focused on supporting people and applying and making sure their applications are complete. So um, I would encourage your band of residents, if you have any questions at all, to contact our office. Um, and our, this application for the county is now linked off our website as the main rental assistance application. So if people go to cunninghamtownship.org, you can link to the countywide application and we will, and if you submit it to us, we'll actually package it and walk it over. So we physically bring it over and make sure that the application gets there and we track it and, may, and do follow up. Um, eviction, so I, I uh, got a call from uh, two different moms this weekend 
um, both were homeless in Champaign-Urbana, um, and they said that they had been evicted. Uh, and I did confirm today that evictions have resumed as of June 25th, and this is specifically for tenants who did not submit a COVID declaration to their landlord or were not eligible to. Many people did not know that you needed to actually submit a declaration to your landlord. There's a link in the memo. Um, there's a link at the bottom of our, um, uh, there's a link on our website as well to do that. So essentially, folks still have time. They have to submit that by the end of July. Um, to their landlord, but we are seeing uh, the courts start, which is very frightening. Um, I know that Champaign County Courts is currently hiring a mediator. Um, they're actually through a third party hiring a mediator to help with uh, landlord tenant mediation. We, I really was hoping that would be in place before we saw the eviction court fire up, um, and that person is still in the process of being hired. So. Um, we have a call in to find out more about what the courts, what it's going to look like. Um, the state of Illinois eviction moratorium will likely end August 24th, but um, it looks like evictions have already started and, and I did confirm that they were legal evictions. Everything we've seen to date has been an illegal eviction. Landlord says, you know, I'm demolishing the property. You have to be out tomorrow. That happened in Urbana and a family was made homeless because they believed their landlord. Just so you know, you cannot be evicted unless a sheriff is involved. If a sheriff does not come to your house, you are not being evicted. It is not a legal eviction and you should call Land of Lincoln Legal Assistance or Township immediately and we can assist. So um, so I'm concerned about rental assistance and uh, you know, kind of, I guess I would say, you know, put on your oxygen mask first and we'll get moving. With utility support, we continue, we've had a number of payoffs. Um, we have about one household per day. They're all screened for whether or not they're behind in rental and need rental assistance. If they need rental assistance, we send them to the emergency rental assistance. Um, so uh, we continue to process, I would say small requests and uh, that fund, you know, we still have dollars in the fund and probably will so through the summer. Housing advocacy, um, we continue to put people on the wait list for Pinewood Place in Urbana. Um, anyone who is awaiting disability, who has an active SSI case, awaiting a determination from the federal government on SSI, who has a disability, um, through the townships can apply for the Pinewood Place in Urbana. So we're in the process of assisting with that and we um, did a kind of a webinar on how that how people could come to township for that. We've now helped seven homeless households with housewarming, so there were two more this last month, um, and we have supported 128 general assistance participants representing 87 households to apply for our subsidized housing. Um, so, so far we've gotten 23 households in, and we continue to work on that. Uh, the Housing Authority is um, in the process of launching new vouchers uh, for the homeless, and we're meeting with the Housing Authority, our office, and Andy's office this week to discuss how that will look. So hopefully I'll have an update on those vouchers. It's about 113 vouchers. Before last summer, we received, as a community, 50 vouchers. And we pretty much have, uh, we've come close to expending those. So it is a, really a blessing to have the 113 vouchers. Um, emergency housing, see you at home remains closed. I don't have a date because uh, I, I am not a staff member there. My best guess based on what I'm seeing is end of August. Um, on June 12th, which was Sunday, our hotel partner informed us that um, due to City of Urbana restrictions on the length of stay of guests, our, our guests can only stay 28 days. Um, since we're unable to apply for vouchers before 14 days of stay, so you have to actually be in the hotel before you can even start applying for a voucher as a homeless family, you have to be in for 14 days. And it takes a minimum of 20 days to process the voucher, about three weeks, and then we actually have to help people find housing, which we've been doing very quickly because we start the process as the voucher is moving. So our average stay is 41 days, which is phenomenal, but it's not 28 days. <laughs> so we currently have four households in emergency housing, which is great. Um, uh, I think last time we spoke, I, we had eight. Um, uh, some were exited. We had some some issues with exits, but generally speaking, we were able to move people into housing. Uh, the issue is that we submitted our special use permit, which we wanted to do after um, extending the new lease to the tenants at 206 and 208. We submitted that special use permit last week, 
um, and it's scheduled for August 5th at the Plan Commission and the Committee of the Whole of the 16th and then August 23rd. So this is actually past move-in day. So as we anticipated, although it seems to be a worse situation than I expected, you know, the, the window, it's like that um, uh, in the, the Star Wars movie where they're basically trying to get out of the trash compactor and they're stuck in it. That's how we're feeling at Township right now um, is we're not sure if we can keep our emergency shelter open. We may need to stop having intakes um, over the for the next six weeks until we can resolve that. I did uh, send an email as soon as I read my email this morning. I sent an email to the mayor. Mayor graciously responded, and we're going to be discussing to see what what we can do. Um, but I'm very concerned about this because this we have been ha we've had guests stay at this hotel, as has Courage Connection, RPC, and a number of other partners. CU Public Health had people stay at this hotel all over twenty. You know multiple times over 28 days. So that's a little bit of a, a surprise and it caught us off guard and I'm not sure how we were gonna handle it. Um, and then lastly with Bridge to Home, we serve 300, excuse me, 300, that would be a dream. We serve three households with rapid rehousing services um, and we're really ramping up that program uh, to give 12 months of rent for literally homeless families to transition into permanent housing. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'd like to add, some information to that before Please. we start the discussion. Um, and this is regarding the um, situation at the roadway in. Um, this indicates that you were informed on June 12th about the hotel. Yeah. Sorry, it was Sunday. So this yesterday. past Sunday. Yes. Yesterday. Okay. Yes, yesterday. I learned about it two hours ago. So I tried okay. to find out as much as I could in the past two hours. So here's the deal. Um, yes, the city of Urbana has an ordinance that um, restricts regular hotel rooms to 28 days per, per residency. This is because from a safety standpoint and a living standpoint, a typical hotel room isn't geared to, to, to sustain long-term living. There's no stoves, there's no refrigerators, there's no, you know, your typical things that would support a household living for an extended stay. And then there are extended stay rooms that are geared for longer stays. However, from what I understand throughout the pandemic, people have been staying in the hotels for longer than the 28 days. Typically what happens, and even in normal times, um, if a hotel wants to let a guest stay for longer than the 28 days, they'll change rooms and then they'll start the clock over again. And that's what's been happening through the pandemic as I understand it. We did get an email from a guest at the hotel. I don't know whether it was a township client or a guest at the hotel complaining about some of the conditions that seemed to have triggered um, concern on the part of the hotel. And um, like I said, I just heard about all this two hours ago. But it sounds like the management at the hotel is willing to work with township and the other um, local social service providers and will figure it out tomorrow. But this is not suddenly because the city of Urbana is enforcing the 28 day limit. This is because the hotel has chosen to now um, use the 28 day limit as a reason to, I think, trigger this discussion. So I don't know where it's going to go. Like mm -hmm. I said, I just heard about this at what, four o'clock. So, so I look forward yeah. to the conversation tomorrow. I'm sure we can work out something with the hotel. Um, they got to ensure the safety of the rest of the entire, um, resident population at the hotel, the guests, as well as the people living there for several weeks at a time. And some people, as you said, have been staying longer than 28 days, mm -hmm. but that is certainly nothing new. It's been happening through the pandemic. It happens before. It's just how, how it's been. But those, the 28 day limit is in place because, you know, those rooms are not ideal for long-term mm -hmm. stays. They're just not set up for that. But in an emergency, absolutely. It keeps people safe and warm and, mm -hmm. and they have basic facilities. Mm -hmm. So. We'll get it worked out. Yeah. We just don't might be, have might be time to, to speak to the city inspector Martel met with this, the a person we knew that the city inspector was called out and Martel right. met that inspector at on location and I, we, I wasn't sure what would come of it yeah. um, until I got this letter from Roadway okay. yesterday. Well, we'll, so. we'll work it all out tomorrow. We yep. just haven't had been able to do that in the past okay. two hours. So stay tuned. We'll yep. let you know. Thanks. I appreciate sure. you looking into it. 
and, the, and I, I did look into the balance of the Emergency Solutions Grant, which I assume is another source of funds, and there's $300,000 there, correct, that can be used in an emergency for N No, housing? not for our grant. Our grant has to essentially, we have to have them referred from um, centralized intake for the homeless, and then we have to, we need a process of inspecting the property and moving them in. And okay. so far that process has been so extensive that the person who entered the program a month ago is still in okay. our shelter. So absolutely if we had some time um, and we received that referral back, which we, we can always make a request, but we, we can't determine who we receive. We get the referrals from our PC. So we essentially refer everyone and then they refer back okay. the people who fit certain criteria. Okay. Um, so the length of time that it takes to locate housing and inspect it um, and move people into housing is about a month to a month and a half that we would need. And, and actually of the four folks, there are some folks who are on that track. But we also received calls from two families and I said I need to talk to the mayor before we can intake another family right now because wow. the last thing I want is to say you can't come. Right. You, you know, we're yeah. going to kick you out after 28 days because there's no way they will be successful after 28 no. days. I, so. think, I think we can work all this okay. out. We just need some time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Any discussion? Chris. Chris. To, to remind uh, me to look this way. Yeah, I'm used to right. just <laughs> looking at the screen. Uh, um, Daniel, I had a f just a few questions. Um, and Martel, maybe you might uh, know about this. Um, so of the 33 homeless, how many are actually outside? Or are, are you counting also couch surfers and, and you know? Yeah, the, so well, I would say there's two different definitions of homeless that are kind of working definition. HUD definition homeless means literally homeless. They're staying in an unsafe condition outdoors in a car, um, in an abandoned building, um, on the street, in the parks. And then we have McKinney-Vento definition homeless. Um, and that would be somebody who was, did not have a fixed place to stay, typically was moving around from house to house, didn't have an address where they could really receive mail. Um, and so for the 33 homeless, these are folks who essentially they don't have a fixed address. Um, and many of them were staying at CU at home. Um, so now the question of where are they, some of, our, of them are in our program, um, in, the, in the hotel program. Um, we have some folks who are sleeping outside, um, and, and uh, we now have a street outreach team, thanks to COVID uh, and the rise of people sleeping outside. We, uh, we have a street, Martell is part of our street outreach team, as is Shea Robinson, and so we do direct contact with anyone who is street homeless, and the first thing we do is try to sign them up for general assistance, and that basically is the route into housing advocacy where we can get information and help them based on their situation move into permanent housing, whether that's through an emergency housing situation or not. Okay. Um, and, and I get a sense that for those that are outside, you're trying to stay in contact with them. Absolutely. Once, once a week or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and I would say we have a number of um, urban uh, residents who come to our office <laughs> several times a week, sometimes every day. Um, and they may be asking for, you know, uh, toiletries, toothbrushes, um, okay. uh, any, you know, various needs. We have a number of businesses that have generously given us gift cards, and we give gift cards to homeless residents so they can get a bite to eat. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we stay in contact, and, and um, until, we, until the this hotel situation, we, we, as long as we could get them into general assistance and they became our participants, we were able to move folks into hotel rooms so that our goal is to get them off the street as soon as possible. It's very dangerous, especially for women, but also for anyone to be on the street right now. So as long as we're able to engage them. Some folks have uh, mental disabilities that make it difficult for them to engage at that level. So we may be able to get them on general assistance, but they're not, they're, they're having a difficult time actually trusting or wanting to go into hotels. So there's a few situations like that as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Sharice. What happened with CU at Home? I thought they had reopened 
and what they're closed again what what happened mm -hmm. with that yeah so see you at home due to staffing and safety concerns it was beginning of june my my calendar is a smearing <laughs> end of may beginning of june um they greatly downsized their operations so after some conversations with providers like ourselves they agreed to keep those who were on track to get a voucher because you can only get a voucher if you stay in shelter if you're homeless and you're a street homeless you do not qualify for the current vouchers c19 vouchers so basically we had a whole bunch of folks who were in that process of getting those vouchers from through the housing authority that would have basically fallen off that process it was very that would have been very difficult so thankfully see you at home and we're very grateful that they at least retain the folks who are in the voucher process so they wouldn't lose that opportunity and that they've been you know they've been hiring you've probably seen them their emails and on Facebook they've been trying to hire staff um, to increase their capacity um, and we do have a meeting with them in the next week to discuss what that reopening will look like and how we can partner uh, but they are not open to new residents and every single day we have a single person male female who calls us and says they don't they don't have any place to stay in fact a lot of people are being paroled into champaign county and their parole officers say contacts you at home the next place they contact is us and we explain the situation it's not it it's not a good situation it's not a good situation especially with all the water and all the rain that's been happening in the heat it's not safe um okay so how how long does that voucher process take voucher process i would say from the time you cannot be eligible until you've been in a shelter for 14 days in champaign county so it starts after two weeks of being in shelter then you qualify and then essentially i would say depending on the barriers to housing discrimination being the the, the biggest barrier to housing um, for folks with vouchers um, for folks with felony convictions uh, for folks with children um, or who do not are not students um, essentially you know we gotta get through that barrier but we can get people in um, if it, it's probably another month to two months and if they have major barriers it could be three months to move into housing um, so I think the longest that we've seen is three months though even in a difficult situation where it's you know it's hard for that person to because of their credit and their criminal background to get housing and um mr miller was talking about um empty houses I, um i'm i'm assuming that those homes are owned by somebody but are they owned by the city they're owned by the city of urbana two of them are actually the same zoning that you have over on california street so they're not zoned for emergency family housing mm -hmm and um we're looking at those for um uh we're looking at options for those including um helping support first-time home buyers so which okay. is another way to help people build i to think build our life build well so, yeah. yeah i think they were given the, the city of urbana owns those properties and is required to use them as transitional housing uh mm -hmm. and so you know we would be very happy to partner with the city of urbana in providing transitional housing for families it's very hard mm -hmm. to find housing for folks especially for larger families and they're all three bedroom homes so as when on your council with your council hat on which we'll begin here shortly i'd encourage you to look at those properties and see what kind of partnership that we could have together any other questions chandra um when you mentioned the vouchers are and the, it takes three months at max are those the same people who are allowed to stay in the hotel for two weeks and then the or they have to be at cu at home so the hotel program qualifies as shelter okay yep and essentially uh anyone the way we've been doing it is anybody who is actively unsheltered meaning literally homeless on the streets and on band building you know in a tent if they are a general assistance participant in urbana so for cunningham township we've been housing them so we don't want any of our participants except those who uh, may may choose not to be in housing or for some reason 
you know, they've been disruptive in the program and have multiple, in multiple instances, violated the program rules and put other people at risk. There are few situations like that. Other than that, we would like to house them so that um, uh, they can be safe while they're on track to receive a voucher. Mm -hmm. okay. and um, unfortunately, this doesn't exist in Champaign, so we get a lot of calls for, from families and individuals in Champaign who are Champaign homeless because um, they, this, this does not exist in that context. So we control what we can. <laughs> so. And then you mentioned your um, street outreach team. How successful have they been? It's been phenomenal. It's one of the best things that we've done. It's been difficult. Uh, you know, sometimes you think you don't have the capacity to continue stretching and expanding, and then someone comes to your doorstep and you find the capacity. Mm -hmm. And that has been how it's been at Township. Um, uh, I had basically gave the option to staff members if they would like to have some field time to do that outreach and both Martel and Shea have come forward and we're in contact with a lot of individuals um, uh, who are street homeless and I would say anybody who is street homeless, I mean you see people on the streets and they've already, everybody I get this postcard to is like, oh yeah, I know about township. So, but I continue, we continue to show it to people and say, and I say, I am the supervisor, come talk to me. Come talk to me, the buses are free for now. And uh, I'd like to talk with you and see what we can do to help. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question. If, you know, we hand these to people we may see on the street, um, if they are like, oh yeah, I already know about it. Like, what, what do you do then? I mean, I think that's the best just... you can do. But I always tell people, keep this in your card. And when folks ask for money, if you feel like giving them money, could go ahead. And if, but either way, I would say, please give them a card mm -hmm. um, to let them know uh, that we're here. And I do have folks who come in and their whole the card is folded up in their pocket, and they come in and they take the card out, and they're like, <laughs> you know. So it, people come and talk to us that way. We are going to get smaller cards. This is kind of large. So we get business card size as well. And so we encourage our friends and neighbors and residents to, to pass out information about township. And you know, we can, even if somebody is homeless, if they're hungry, we can do food delivery for them. Um, you know, we just would sit down and talk with them and you know, all their information is kept confidential. So we're just here to support them. We're, you know, we're not sharing their information with other folks, which is sometimes the concern. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Grace. Thanks. Thanks for all the presentations and the work you guys are doing. Um, I was wondering about the emergency housing situation because to my understanding it's the hotel stays for now and then hopefully the new property on California. And are there any, um, I don't know, plans or dreams of like a permanent shelter where people know like I don't have a place to stay tonight, this is the place I can go kind of like see you at home was for mm -hmm. Champagne? Mm -hmm. If I could wave my magic wand and I was queen of Urbana, which I'm not, but I have dreamed of this, mm -hmm. um, we need to get past this idea of a single shelter for our community. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not sustainable. Um, it doesn't address the diversity of needs. Um, putting men and women in the same, under the same roof. I think CU at Home has done a great job doing that. That's difficult, but I would not advise it. I think some, we've had people where the abuser has been on one side and the abused on the other in domestic violence situations. And I really think that we need to look at a, a shelter that is in Urbana, similar to what we have in Champaign and not assume that Champaign should bear the full brunt of a shelter. Um, our shelter is families only. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's same day, but it's close. It's about as close as you can get to same day for families. So if you know, someone walks in at three o'clock, we may not be able to accommodate them that night. But honestly, if we are able to accommodate them, if they screen as literally homeless and we can accommodate them that night, we do. Um, and then I do have, um, I have a set of angels who have come to me who have said, if you need someone to just pay the hotel directly for a, somebody, call me. And so those calls that I get on Sunday, it's not township, but I do call, I, I will call those angels and say, I'll be a matchmaker and it's outside of township and say, hey, why don't you all, if you need support, this person can support you and then come talk to us on Monday. So, you know, we are in conversation with you at home. We would like to be able to do 24 seven intake. So this next year for families, 
I would like to be able to do 24-7 intake, and I'd like to partner with the shelter to do that, and we've started those conversations. Because um, ultimately, you, you know, oftentimes a homeless incident will happen after hours or weekends, and we need to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Jaya. Just hoping you could provide some clarification on the timeline with the leases and the incentive that was mentioned earlier, just to give us a clearer sense of where things stand. Yeah, this is the first I've heard of that concern, and I would just really encourage tenants to call us and email us directly because I would love to be able to answer your Maybe questions. I'm not you. I'm sorry. I have not. Really no. You, if you could send me the contact, I, I have, I've responded to the contacts. No, but that's not the me. This is you have to actually contact the supervisor. Excuse me. Excuse me. So, we, so excuse me. Can we have this conversation outside of this meeting, please? Thank you. But I understand your concern, and I hope you can continue this conversation tomorrow. So, uh, so basically, the lease, the month-to-month -month lease, starts the day after their lease ends. So the lease that you approved, if you recall, there were brackets that said day after lease ends. If there was a typo in a lease, I can take a look at it, but this is the first I've heard. So the second is that the July 15th deadline is to sign that lease. The incentive still works for folks who move out by August 15th, but you have to sign it by July 15th so we have some time to plan. So we essentially gave folks a month and if, let's say, for example, you sign it and you don't end up, you, you want to stay month to month, that's fine. Or you sign it and you move out early, you get the incentive. So essentially, the only options folks have at this, pro the two options are you either stay through the end of your lease, you don't contact us at all, you don't want to have a conversation with us, that's fine, you leave it at the end of your lease, cool. Or you sign the lease that you all approved and essentially, you have to do that by July 15th, which is coming up soon, and then essentially you can either receive the incentive if you move out before the 15th, you give us you know, three days notice you're moving out, or you can stay month to month as long as you're in compliance with that new lease. Thank you. Okay. I say one, may I ask one more question? One more question. <laughs> okay, and the, the month to month is up until December 31st? Correct. Okay, so if, Angela, okay, if you, you sign your, your July 15th, the, the lease for the, the new owner is basically what I'm getting from this. New owner, new lease. Okay, so you sign the lease by, the, by July 15th. That puts you in line to be to receive the incentive should you move out by the 15th of August, correct? Correct. Okay, I'm just trying to yeah. okay. get through the red tape. Thank you. Okay, if you aren't moved out by the 15th of August, you still have until December 31st to, to move, and that's when it, the month-to-month -month lease kicks in. But I don't know that you get, I think it's a prorated incentive after that, or no. no? Incentive ends August 15th. Okay. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yep. It should be. If, if your lease ends July 31st, it should say August 1st, and it's simply a typo that we can correct. And, and that's the sort of thing you're going to need to work out exactly. To get just, tomorrow. Exactly. Just got to email me back. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And just for clarification, because I thought that this was the um, lease that you all, the board, mm -hmm. approved for the July 1st date. Yeah, just to, yeah, I understand the confusion. It's just the one they approved because different leases end at different times. In brackets, it just says the day after the lease ends because some people had a lease end May 31st, June 30th, or July 31st. Okay. I think after the meeting, even, you could talk with her one-on-one. -on -one. Any other questions for uh, Danielle? And you assume there's no assessor report this week. Okay. He's not present. Uh, we'll move on to unfinished business. 
Is Any a new, bus new business? Okay, we'll no further business before the Cunningham, Cunningham Town Board will stand adjourned, and this will be followed by a meeting of the Urbana City Council when um, the clerk indicates she's ready. Thank you. Um, can I make a motion for a quick recess? Two minute recess while we're getting ready for the next meeting. Yes. We will move on to the meeting of the Urbana City Council for Monday, July 12th, 2021. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Hersey? Here. Council Member Colasetti? Here. Council Member Bishop? Here. Council Member Wilkin? Here. Council Member Quisenberry? Here. Council Member Evans? Here. Council Member Wu? Mayor Marlin? Here. Next item is approval of minutes from the June 28th, 2021 City Council meeting. Is there a motion for approval? I move approval of the minutes. A second. Moved by James, seconded by Sharice. Were there any corrections? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Uh, we don't have any additions to the agenda. Um, we'll move on to presentations and public input. If you want to address the Urbana City Council, please fill out the yellow card in the back of the room. And we'll start with Alan Max Axelrod. And you'll have five minutes to speak. Thank you. My name is Alan Max Axelrod. I'm a resident. In, can speak into me? the microphone, please. Can you hear me? No, yeah. that's better. All right. My name is Alan Max Axelrod. I'm a resident of Urbana in Ward 3. And a year ago today, I received a tweet from Ameren, Illinois, stating their intent to start sending off shutoff notices July 29th of 2020 and to start disconnections August 11th of 2020. I reached out to the governor and then I subsequently reached out to every organization I knew of. No Ameren shutoffs today has extended utility shutoff moratoria four times, has one over $115 million, we have a FOIA out to the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity for updated numbers because we know that they have been spending money well past May 17th, and it may well be $200 million that have helped vulnerable Illinoisans. That did not need to happen as it did, where it took 49 member organizations, nearly a year of advocacy, just to have facts recognized that were stated in a 2007 Congressional Research Survey entitled Pandemic Influenza and Analysis of State Preparedness and Response Plans. It was the, from the Congressional Research Service. I apologize, I misspoke. I have previously talked to you about the need to recognize the importance of protecting our community members' mental health and well being and recognizing when other bad faith actors in the community are trying to weaponize that. I'd like to thank Grace for acknowledging that. And this isn't something where I know people are used to cynicism. This isn't something where I'm trying to do this to score any political points or put anybody down in particular. Yesterday, I trained yet another organization on basic literacy when it comes to psychological abuse in community and organizing spaces. This is something that I do regularly because it is so pervasive. So I ask for anybody else who hasn't spoken up on that issue to at least try to do better in the future. I also wanted to state that in my capacity as a Champaign, as a Champaign Urbana Democratic Socialist of America co-chair, we've made some significant progress on the support for workforce training program. Last week, both the Party for Socialism and Liberation and the Democratic Socialists of America began canvassing our community for signing on to a petition calling for two particular things, increasing the enrollment of the SWIFT program through obviously asking the cities of Urbana and Champaign to appropriate American Rescue Plan funds, but also increasing the stipends of everyone enrolled. 
Last week, Mayor Deb Finan of the Champaign City Council said that she was willing to take a risk on the use of American Rescue Plan funds. Things are that serious in our community. And I don't think anybody would deny that things are serious when it comes to gun violence and needing to think outside the box in confronting it. The usual steps will almost inevitably be taken, but we do not have to isolate it just to the usual steps. So that said, we will be continuing to canvas every nook and cranny of the community, both in person and online, for petition signatures for this particular initiative. We hope that additional members of this council, thank you to both uh, Chandra and to Grace for walking with the Democratic Socialists of America last week or the week before. Sorry, time's a little bit of an illusion to me at this point, where we were just doing some good old fashioned community service of showing people where they can get COVID vaccines, a helpline that they can call for domestic violence survivor support, and a phone number they could call for assistance with utility shutoffs. The invite is open for everybody else on the council to make similar good faith gestures. It doesn't have to be with us, but we want to see some movement from the city council when it comes to trying to actually increase accessibility to community members that have frankly given up. Here's the degree to which they've given up. When I was canvassing at the Illinois terminal last week, I ran into some black youth and I explained to them what the SWIFT program was, and they said, we're never gonna see any of that money. And th they were saying that as a reason not to sign. And then I said one additional thing to them, and then they signed. What I said was, there's no high school degree or certification required in order to participate in SWIFT. Right then and there, the black disenfranchised youth that I was talking to signed. That is real. Please consider it, thank you. Next up is Robert Weiss. Welcome, you have five minutes. My name is Robert Weiss. I live at 1005 Philo Road here in Urbana. I want to thank all of you for giving me this opportunity and time. And Ward 4, I would like for you to write down this number, 3907588. Her name is Doris, that's my wife, Do another 2174. My phone number on my phone, I don't know. But anyway, I'm here because of parking. Uh, the house that I'm living in, was put up in 1961. There are five feet on each side of it. There's no alley, so the backyard is forgotten. Only thing I have to work with is the front yard. I would like to match the concrete that's existing there and just go to the sidewalk. I got uh, drawings of it. The mayor's even got a copy and um, there's a lady, can't thank her name, but anyway, I met her here that's got a copy of it. The uh, Kevin of the Planning Commission, I'm sure he'd give me a call. I've never seen Kevin, but Trotter is her name. Mm -hmm. The time she come to my house, the first time she pulled in the drive, the second time she parked along the curb and just walked up during your warning flashers and then left. She knows my problem. I'm trying to get this solved. I've got three kids. I've got grandkids. My daughter even calls me and has me to move my car in the garage that I've converted from a carport to a garage where she can get her truck in because there's no place to park. Well, she, I haven't mowed my yard in two years because I've got a walker. And I need want to pour that out there, but I want to get it set. When I call the people to do the work, they don't have to waste no time but come in here and try to get it set up. So that's why I'm here. Uh, it, it needs to be done. It's really a health uh, 
a safety deal. It ain't no planning commission deal. It's for the safety of people getting in and on my property and being able to leave. It's, you have, to, would you come, call my house, make appointment, and come by, I would like to show you personally. Trotter didn't realize it till she got to see it and lived through it when she had to back out. But I would like for you to call, make an appointment, and we'll be there. And we can maybe get this thing resolved. This has been going on five years. Anybody got any questions they want to ask me about it? Well, at this point, we don't do back and forth questions, but we can follow up. I sure appreciate it. Cause okay. I, oh, uh, I will add one thing. I do want to add 30 inches to one side other than matching the concrete that's already there for length. I don't much care about the other. I just want to make it look like it was done when it was done, like it was totally planned that way. But I got two garbage cans there and the grass is dying. I'd like to add 30 inches all the way along to one side. Don't mean nothing, just where we can, I can use a walker along the side of my car and the garbage cans don't kill the grass. That's the only thing that would be different than I can think of. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next item, or next up is Tracy. Um, hi, uh, I'm Tracy Chong. Uh, good evening, City Council. Um, Mayor Marlin, um, last week you responded to the public, um, calling for public input via Zoom to be an option um, so that we can increase um, accessibility to, um, for everyone. Um, you said that a banner could not do that because it would be a violation of the Illinois Open Meetings Act. Um, I have read through the OMA several times and could not find any specific clause that would make giving public input via Zoom an option um, that would make it um, a violation of the OMA. So um, could you provide the public with the clause that says so and explain the city's um, interpretation of the clause and why you think that it would be a violation? Um, if one has not been paying attention um, one might think that um, you are actually being very, very careful to comply with the Open Meetings Act. One might be naive and think that you are now so very, very careful because of the huge amount of taxpayers' money that you have wasted when the city had to settle an OMA lawsuit. One where you had multiple warnings from the public and even from former council member Jared Miller, Jared Miller that you were violating the OMA. But Mayor Marlin, your intentions are clear. All this talk about being careful is exactly the same tactic that you have been using in the past to create hurdles for the public to have, um, that want to have their voices heard, especially voices who disagree with you. You and your cronies are actively silencing the public, and this is still happening. At the last um, Civilian Police Review Board meeting on June 23rd, your newly hired Community Engagement Coordinator, Lamont Pappas, the one candidate for the position that was childhood friends with police leadership, the one candidate that was hired out of over 100 candidates, and the one person who contacted Chief Serafin about the position before it was even announced publicly. He prevented me from speaking at the past CPRB meeting, even though board members were ready to hear what I said. So this is an ongoing problem. That's what you do very well. Hire and appoint those around you who will do what it takes to obscure transparency and accountability, even through illegal means and at, at tax, taxpayers' expense. Just like how you and Chief Serafin have filtered out appointees, candidates who apply to the Civilian Police Review Board. Also, just like how City Administrator Carol Mitten shuts down civilian police complaints at every opportunity. 
Um, this is still happening. Um, you guys should watch the CPRB meeting on May 26 um, and see an example of that. One suggestion, Mayor Marlin, next time when um, you complain to city council and the public about how it is so very, very difficult to fill vacancies in boards and commissions, maybe you can give a shout out to the residents and candidates who have been denied a chance to serve on these boards because you are afraid that they might actually hold the city and police department accountable for misconduct. Um, thanks for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is, there's no name. Topic is public input. I apologize. I apologize if I forgot to write my name. Uh, my name is Sarah Nixon. Hello, City Council. Um, I'm here again to um, ask for the city to enact a hybrid public participation model at city uh, public meetings and um, to allow more accessibility to the public for public comment via Zoom so that people can feel involved, people can feel heard, and most of all, to uh, promote the likelihood that people, that constituents will participate. At, at last week's city council meeting, Mayor Marlin stated that uh, remote public input would constitute an OMA violation as Ms. Chong has just um, spoken to. Um, and stated that uh, the city legal staff ha has uh, advised this or a position to this effect. Um, I think it's very concerning that the um, city leadership and um, legal counsel are pushing this um, unfounded position and I would like the council to look into this. Um, I would also like to just um, read into the record from an article that was published today online uh, by local um, independent media page, um, checkcu.org. Uh, I'll read just part of it. Um, Mayor Marlin did not cite any provision of the Open Meetings Act, which would prohibit a public body from allowing public input via any remote or telephonic service and check CU cannot find any such provision in the statute. I'll leave it at that um, and just move on to a couple of other comments. Um, I, I wasn't able to attend the Cunningham Township meeting, but I find it truly concerning as a member of the public to witness again and again and again the uh, cries coming from individuals who are being impacted, who are being pushed out of their homes and um, pushed into homelessness by an, our one and only um, local organization whose mandate it is to end homelessness. I, I, I think everyone on council should have real concerns and I, I'm sure you do. Um, I think this really needs um, examining and, and a, a deeper look into what exactly is going on um, at our local um, social services providers. Um, and I, I'll also comment on one, um, one statement that I overheard or that I heard you know, at, the, um, at, at part of that uh, township meeting. Um, to the effect that at CU at home or in a model where you have one um, sort of one overarching homeless shelter, you can have abusers on one side and the abused on the other. Uh, we have Courage Connection has a domestic violence shelter. There should be no reason for um, that scenario. I know for a fact, City Council, that there 
are often a lot of empty beds at the Courage Connection Shelter. And, and I know that from firsthand witness experiences. But what we're hearing stated to the public is that there are no beds. And I think it's worth raising this issue because I'm wondering, I'm wondering if the city needs to conduct or the city council maybe needs to conduct a bit more, uh, let's say, independent uh, looking into or oversight as to how these services are being run. Um, ask for feedback from end users if you can obtain that. Maybe don't rely solely on the reports, uh, auto, you know, you know, reports authored um, internally from the organizations who, um, you know, are anything but objective about their performance. In closing, um, I have one more comment that I would like uh, about an issue that I would like to bring to the council's attention, um, and that issue is to ask you to look into the failure of the, looking for the name of this grant, it slipped my mind, the R3 program. I am out of time and I will speak about it again uh, at a subsequent uh, meeting, but this was the promised um, grants from the 25% cannabis tax. A large amount of money was promised to our communities and people applied for it. Thank you. Your, your did, time is up. Thank and you. And it never materialized. Thank you. Um, we had uh, public input from Reverend Dr. Evelyn Underwood via Sharice. Uh, I, Dr. Reverend Dr. Evelyn Underwood and Bishop King James Underwood support the SWIFT program, which provides short-term, one-year or less training in more than 20 career options that leads to employment in in-demand fields with life-supporting wages. Besides tuition and fee waivers to take classes, one may receive assistance in the form of a stipend. I believe this can help families tremendously. Please fully fund this pro program for Banner residents or enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Champaign and Champaign County Board, Reverend Dr. Evelyn Underwood and Bishop King James Underwood. Thank you. Uh, next up is Lance Pittman. Hi, City Council. Thanks for letting me talk. Um, I just wanted to uh, also um, support the um, <clears throat> uh, online participation um, and address this uh, idea of the Open Meetings Act. Uh, I was just looking at the uh, Illinois Commerce Commission's website, and I pulled up their public input, and it has an option for uh, appearance uh, and you can comment remotely. I have it on the website. So if it is a violation in any way of Open Meetings Act, then uh, I don't know, maybe Urbana can sue the <laughs> Illinois Commerce Commission, um, or at least maybe talk to someone there about uh, why that is okay. Um, I think it's important because there are lots of reasons why people might not feel comfortable coming uh, to a public setting. Uh, we know that the Delta variant of uh, COVID can infect you even if you are fully vaccinated. There are people who can't be fully vaccinated for various reasons. There are also people who, uh, even if they are fully vaccinated, uh, they could be uh, long haulers. I don't think we know the percentage of people who were infected with COVID that become long haulers. Um, I'm one though. Uh, fortunately, my case is very mild. Uh, you read cases in the news about people who, uh, are infected with COVID, become a long hauler, and then if they so much as take a shower one day, they can't get out of bed for a week. Um, so those people have a right to public comment just as much as anybody else does, I think. Um, there's obviously lots of other reasons. People are, uh, don't have cars, don't live uh, near public transportation, um, all sorts of other reasons. Um, you might say, why doesn't somebody just send an email to their uh, council representative and have it be read out loud? Well, I've seen at least one meeting of the Danville City Council 
uh, in which a resident uh, sent in a comment to be read aloud and uh, the person reading it disparaged the person who sent it in, did not read the full comment, and then said the person was crazy. Uh, so I'm not saying that any of you would necessarily do that, but I think that a resident has the right, if they want to, to have all of their words heard uh, regardless. Um, I'll move on to uh, just, again, reiterating uh, support for the SWIFT program, and uh, if there's any way of uh, matching funds, as has been suggested um, by previous uh, public commenters. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Martel Miller. How y'all doing again? Um, I want y'all to support the SWIFT program. I'm wish y'all really looking to support that, especially for the young youths that's going through what they're going through. And um, the miseducation of the schools is not helping the young black men at all. So they need to get where they can take care of themselves, get trades, something they can use. Um, I heard something about the police review board. And when I, I've been talking about police review boards for over probably 15 years. I wish police review boards um, could actually have subpoena power. Um, and this, if it's elected by one person like the mayor, they interview all the people. I don't think that's fair because I was with a group of citizen justice of peace. We had two people in our group that looks into that was looking into the one was looking into racial profiling, the other one was look, looking into um, I would say um, government violence. The violence is put on you by the government, which that means police uh, brutality. Um, I think it should come in for maybe three or four board members of picking people for the citizen UV board instead of one person, because we need to get the right people in the right seats for the people that's not represented by law enforcement or friends of law enforcement. I'm not in our law enforcement, but I didn't had three sons actually beat up by the police. One was in here and cup and pepper spray. It didn't happen in the band and happened in champagne. It, most people know about it. And another thing I'm going to talk about when the lady came up here and talked about courage connection. The job I've been in, we have deal with people coming in there and been through um, um, being abused by their partners, domestic violence. Um, a lot of times um, they said they don't have any open or they're not in danger of their, um, their perpetrator. Um, right now, I've been hearing that they're out of funds to house people. If the lady got more information about that, I wish she would let us know about it because we then had, had a couple of people turn away from courage connections in the last couple of weeks. You know, um, I go to see you at home. I see the people there. I see the women there. I see it's uncomfortable for a lot of women because you got a lot of people with trauma. You know, um, when, you, when you hurt, hurt people hurt people. And the reason I know that, I grew up in a community where I seen where hurt people hurt people. I lost my best friend two years ago to gun violence to a young man I know had been hurting since he was 10 years old. I was so angry at him when he did what he did. But when I took a look at what he'd been through in his life, I was wondering where in part of his life I could have helped him. Maybe he wouldn't have been so hurt where he wanted to hurt another. You know, we got to look at the homeless situation in Champaign, Urbana. Champaign got a shelter. Urbana got to look at theirs. I know y'all walk down the street and see these people. You know, I know that the mayor see these people get complaints about these people. We get calls and off. My, my, my card, I, most people know my number before I ever start working at Township because I got a public number. I gave it to public because I want this to be a solution, not someone talking about the problem. I don't go to any meetings anymore because every meeting I go to, I done been through about 
I say between six and seven hundred meetings in the last I say sixteen years. Talk about the same problem. Same problems, the twenty five problems, but they won't pick one of them out to find a solution for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Angie W. Hi. Um, I just really wanted to thank Alderwoman Hersey for getting clarification on the lease at 206 and 208 East California. And I also just um, wanted to say, you know, there has been a lot of negativity around the real estate associated with the two buildings. But Mayor Marlin and um, Carol Mitten, the city administrator, did stop by, not necessarily to see me specifically, but just to see um, the buildings that they've heard so much about. And um, I just happened to run into them there. And they were just very gracious. And of course, the circumstances clearly aren't changing. But it really means a lot when people listen. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the Urbana City Council? Okay, <clears throat> we'll move on to council input and communication. Any council comments? Is that a hand? Grace? Uh, yes. Did we have an email to read too for public comment? That was read. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. I don't know where I was. Um, yes, my comments. I did want to say about the Open Meetings Act. Um, I didn't find in there either where it says we can't do hybrid meetings, so I would like to see that. I think it's definitely more accessible for people to be able to do remote. I think that's pretty evident by our turnout the past two meetings versus the past year or so online. Um, it, there is a provision that says that the home rule units um, may enact an ordinance prescribing more stringent requirements binding upon itself which would serve to give further notice to the public and facilitate public access to meetings. And um, you know it seems like the whole point here is that any person uh, must be permitted an opportunity to address public officials and it be on the record recorded by the public body. Uh, there is case law that says that um, written filings are a violating violation of OMA. I know that you can say the alternative is that people can come in person, but if someone cannot come in person and their only option is written, um, that seems to be not very accessible. So I would like to have more information on that and um, think that the way I see it, um, we can change it and I'd love to know why not if we can't. Um, I think it's really important to hear from the public as much as possible if we are to serve the people of Urbana. And um, another point, too, was about the city-owned transition houses. Um, from what I've been gathering, it sounds like the township is happy to partner with the city um, for the case management aspect of the properties, and the city can still own and maintain the physical properties. Um, also, to my understanding, the deeds to those properties specify that they are required to be used for transitional housing that they have not been lately. Um, so I know that this is probably a bigger, longer conversation, but in general, just wondering um, why they aren't being used and would like to see us partnering on how to use those because I think that's really important resources for families who may need them. And we know that there is a need and a long wait list for families waiting to get into housing. So I would love to see those put to good use. Thank you. Any other council comments? Chris. Um, I just wanted to uh, confirm Council Member Wilkins' observations. I too read the OMA and I can't find any uh, prohibition against Zoom uh, input. So uh, I think uh, we need uh, either to see what it is that prohibits Zoom, and if it's not there, I, I'm like uh, Council Member Wilkins. I, I encourage more public input and uh, I think it, it um, with a limit to an hour um, but otherwise I, I want to increase access and give everybody a chance to speak thank you Jaya I, I also would like to just echo, echo actually both of the points that, that Grace brought up and specifically wanting to see 
the documentation of where does it say that, what are our options, making sure that that's clear not only to council but also to the public. James. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Open Meetings Act. Um, I, I have talked to other uh, public bodies in our area, um, specifically the county, and how they came to their opinion about uh, whether Zoom participation was allowed in their um, in-person meetings, and they have a they have a uh, an opinion from the state's attorney's office, uh, which I've asked them to share with us, if they could. Regarding that, um, one of the things uh, you have to be careful about is because an act is silent on something, that doesn't necessarily give you the ability to do it. I look at what the governor had to do with their with his proclamation that allowed us to do this during that time, and uh, I wonder why that was necessary if we could have had public comment all along um, for Zoom meetings. Um, but I think the best approach, and this is what has happened when, when the law is silent or if there's a conflict, there's a process we can utilize, which is to make a request to the Attorney General of the state to um, speak on this. I think it would be very uh, good for the whole state for us to say, this is our question, the law is silent on it, can we do this? And uh, the Attorney General has done this time and time again and they are, the, they are the lawyer of the state. They are the interpreters of the law. And if they say we can do it, then we can do it. And um, I would be one who would say um, that we should do it uh, because I do believe in um, broader public input and removing barriers. But I don't, I don't believe that the op you can't look at the Open Meetings Act and say, I don't see anything forbidding this that means we can do it. There are other parts of the act that talk very sp specifically about what needs to be in person and what's not allowed. And so the, the intent of the act uh, is the business that we do in person needs to be here and there's only a few exceptions that, that are defined very specifically to that. And so I would prefer to go the, the, the route of asking the Attorney General for an opinion and helping the whole state move forward into this new normal that we could take advantage of. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I have a couple. I, uh, first of all, related to the Open Meetings Act, I appreciate that approach. In fact, that's what we uh, plan to do. Um, and we have had the experience over the past year and a half where we've ventured into territory and then have had complaints filed against the city, we've been sued, so I want to make sure we're on very sound legal ground before we change anything. We know we are complying right now with the Open Meetings Act. So before we can talk about options, we have to make sure that we actually have this as an option. So appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, I also want to address the comments on the SWIFT program. Last Thursday, Carol Mitten, Carla Boyd, and I uh, went to Parkland College. We wanted to follow up because we had been hearing so much about the SWIFT program from the public. We met with President of Parkland College, Tom Ramage, um, Executive Vice President Pamela Lau, the Director of the SWIFT program, um, Alicia Beck, and Communications Director Stephanie Stewart. And it was a gr very good meeting. We um, obtained you know, nice background on the SWIFT program as well as the many other workforce development and uh, workforce training programs at Parkland. Um, the college is very uh, appreciative of the public support for SWIFT. They also are very appreciative of the interest in Parkland's um, programs you know, in general. And I think we're all, I, I don't know if I can't speak for the rest of the council, but personally, I'm a huge fan of the community college. I taught there for 14 years. I was a founding member of the part-time faculty union at Parkland, and I helped negotiate the very first contract. So I'm very familiar with Parkland and the value that it has in the community. Um, what we heard from President Ramage for however, and from everyone we met with was this. Number one, the SWIFT program was initiated. It was an initiative of the Legislative Black Caucus. It was funded that way. 
and it's intended to support African American students and to get them into these job training programs and really to help open doors to opportunities to, to, to jobs and careers. And it does a terrific job at that. Um, from President Ramage's message to us was, number one, the program is very well funded. <clears throat> number two, they have excess capacity. Their biggest challenge is not money. They don't need money. In fact, they, don't, they specifically said, please don't spend your ARPA money on this program. But what they do need the community to help with is encouraging students to get through the door, to get them to the door of Parkland and to get them through the door. Parkland has the programs, the support services, the people, the capacity to take it from there. But what they need the community's help in is getting the students um, to the door. And that's how we can help in terms of supporting that SWIFT program and really getting students into that SWIFT program. So all the, all the people who have spoken over the past few weeks who are working with um, members of the community who you think would, could benefit from this, I, I urge you to number one, um, do whatever you can to encourage the people you work with to get out to Parkland and the folks there will be happy to talk with them about the program and I know there's I think they're doing some orientation programs throughout the community as well but Alicia Beck is the director she's happy to talk to potential students and to talk with um, all of us to see how we can help get students out there it's a terrific program um, but but they are very well funded and they have a lot of capacity to take on more students now so Thank you so much for your support for that program and for everything that Parkland is doing. It's, it's a pathway to the future. It really changes lives. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my years there and since then. It's a life-changing opportunity out there. So that's what we know about SWIFT. And I appreciate the um, time that, that um, the folks at Parkland spent educating us all on that. And let's see. I think that's all. All right, we'll move on to uh, any other council comments? Did everyone get a chance? Okay. We'll move on to unfinished business. There is none. Reports of standing committee. This will be Chandra Bishop. And these are both on the consent agenda. Yes. Um, two items on the consent agenda. I recommend approval of resolution number 2021-06. Dash 028R, a resolution approving a City of Urbana Community Development Block Grant Program Agreement, CCRPC Energy Efficiency Upgrade, Homestead Apartments, um, and resolution number 2021-06-029R, a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement for area-wide records management system, ARMS, support services, um, as listed on the consent agenda. I'll give a second if we need one for the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. So moved by Chandra, seconded by James. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Hersey? Yes. Council Member Colasetti? Yes. Council Member Bishop? Yes. Council Member Wilkin? Yes. Council Member Quisenberry? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. That motion or that agenda passes. Uh, we have no items on the regular agenda. Uh, are there reports from special committees? Yes. Um, what, what are the special committees? I've been wondering if that is us or staff or um, what are the special committees? It, it, it has been in the past. Um, so occasionally there would have been a report from Sister Cities Committee. That's an example. There are very few special committees, actually. And this is an item on the agenda that has been there for years. but. Um, so it's not council committees at, at, at this point, and, and we don't really have any other special committees that I can think of. Yeah. I, I did um, get an email about the, from the Sister Cities uh, people um, since I took Dennis Roberts' place, and um, so maybe we can have a conversation about what I'm supposed to do with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to do that. Um, reports of officers. None this week. There's no new business. Uh, 
with no further business, then this meeting stands adjourned.